Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session for all the participants and also the speakers. Uh, my name is Asli Heitzer. I'm from the International AIDS Society, and I'm working as a senior project manager for the Global HIV Vaccine Enterprise. And today I'm here with my beautiful co-chair, Ethel Makila, who is um, Director of Communications, Advocacy and Policy at IAVI Africa. And we are going to talk about engaging hidden, hard to reach and unreached populations under HIV prevention and vaccine research, unpacking challenges and potential strategies. And in these 45 minutes, we will have short presentations um, followed by questions and answers. We invite you to have your questions at the end of the session. And with that, I'm handing over to Ethel. Thank you so much, Ashley. And welcome, everyone. So today we are going to be speaking about current experiences and on the ground challenges in identifying and engaging hidden, hard to reach and unreached populations. And this is with respect to emerging HIV risk networks. We're going to be looking at the critical implications of digital sexual networks on the risk perception, on the prevention practices, including recent trends in the usage of digital platforms. This hopefully will help us get a better understanding of the profiles of prevention needs on HIV product aspirations and among the, the untapped networks from the kind, you know, the difference between the untapped networks and the currently reached networks. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, begin the presentations. Um, I'll introduce our presenters for the day. We have two presentations, two brief presentations. The first one will be by Charity Rugube, and she's from Zimbabwe Health Intervention. Ms. Rugube is an exceptional development practitioner with vast gender equity and social inclusion experience. And this experience spans over 10 years in Zimbabwe. She has a wealth of technical expertise in gender awareness programs. And currently, she's the senior GESI technical officer for the Dreams Rise program in Zimbabwe. So Charity is going to be taking us through a presentation on social behavioral structural barriers hindering linkage of hidden and hard to reach populations. Over to you. Um, afternoon, and it's so hard uh, when presenting uh, during the lunch hour. Uh, hopefully, we should be able to uh, engage each other. Like uh, it has been highlighted, uh, we are going to share our experiences uh, from implementing uh, DREAMS in Zimbabwe, where we also want to really uh, share our experiences around um, engaging the hard to reach, uh, but basically also exploring ways in which we have been also able to, re to really um, address the issues that affect them and also how we are also uh, uh, engaging through various uh, strategies that we have. Uh, next slide. So in terms of uh, presentation outline, like I've also highlighted, uh, it's going to touch uh, how we are identifying these uh, hard to reach and how we are also mapping the rights holders into the program and also basically going to really address the social behavioral and the structural uh, barriers and we would finally share the strategies and the promising uh, 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 interventions. The next slide. So in terms of dreams, uh, where we are, where we have presence is uh, uh, dreams rise. So we are basically in, in those uh, districts uh, in total, there are 11 districts where it's high burden HIV districts. Reasons being, these are the districts that you might also find they are closer to the border. Uh, they are also found uh, in the rural areas. They are also uh, found in peri -Ebin. And this is where um, 
in most cases, uh, we have not been really intentional to really target uh, the undeserved, those that are likely to be left out, those that are also likely to be really vulnerable. They are found in those uh, districts, and that's where we are. And based on the statistics in Zimbabwe, HIV prevalence among girls and young women, especially aged 15 to 19, it's uh, sitting at 3.8 compared to their to their out, uh, their counterparts, which is sitting at 2.1. This is according to our Zinfia 2020. So there's really need for us to really prioritize HIV burdened districts so that we are able to really contribute towards the epidemic control in re in reducing HIV uh, new infections amongst the adolescent girls and the young women. We are targeting the 10 to 24. We have actually been left out in the sake of care due to either their location, their cultural beliefs, values, and identity. The program is intentionally delivering uh, a combination prevention where we have the biomedical, the behavioral structure through empowering the adolescent girls and young women so that we are also able to strengthen their families, not, in, uh, not excluding the communities, so that we also create an enabling environment for adolescent girls in preventing HIV and sexual violence. The next slide. So how are we, this is uh, uh, in, uh, in, in an illustration which is basically showing the framework uh, in terms of uh, how we are implementing the dreams. And I think for those that are in dreams, it's actually providing a holistic, uh, which looks at uh, having the adolescent girls at the center uh, where we want to empower, but uh, around them, we need to mobilize the communities, we need to engage their families, and also we need also to ensure we engage their partners so that we reduce the risk. The next slide. So in terms of how we are identifying these um, uh, adolescent girls and young women into the DREAMS uh, program, we have a screening uh, tool where we really want to ensure that we target those that are uh, eligible for enrollment into the DREAMS program. And we actually do this in consultation with the stakeholders and communities. And we do together to include the co-creation where we want to influence, uh, you know, actions, uh, messaging, where we really need to ensure that we have the voices from the community. We then uh, use the vulnerability and risk criteria uh, where we are like developing the, the, it could be messaging like I've also highlighted uh, so that we are able to address the challenges that are uh, affected them. We are also inclusive um, in the fact that when you look at adolescent girls and young women, we need to go further beyond just age uh, and sex and be inclusive by also targeting uh, people with disability to include the teenage mothers. We basically do the uh, screen, uh, the reassessment of vulnerability at, uh, at two points after six months and also after a year so that we are able to reassess and continuously uh, monitor uh, the adolescent uh, girls and young women's risk so that we are able to really provide timely uh, response. The next slide. So in terms of uh, context, because we also want to be targeting. So this is uh, our experience where we have noted that for us to be really targeted, we really need to do some hotspotting. So what we have uh, learned uh, in our implementation is where we have noted that within those uh, districts, we also have um, uh, communities that are um, that we really need to target so that we're also able to really uh, uh, reach the uh, adolescent girls and young women. So our experience is where we have also noted that these um, sites are really very important for us to be intentional. We have uh, farming communities. We have also realized that we have also mining sites is also places that would also place our adolescent girls at risk to include alcohol and public outlets in the communities that could also serve as uh, providing, uh, you know, um, a risk for our adolescents to include uh, communities where we have also realized that they also experience a high prevalence rates when it uh, uh, comes to child marriages. And like I've also highlighted that uh, some of our districts like Mangwe, uh, Bulilima, Wanda, and uh, Bait Bridge, they are also closer to the border. So we also uh, have to be really um, uh, strategic to also identify communities that are closer or they are along the highway corridor because they are also closer to the borders that I've also highlighted. Uh, the next slide. So um, what uh, we did as a program in 2022, 
we conducted uh, what we call gender equality and social inclusion assessment so that we also are in a position to understand what are the social uh, barriers that uh, would also be impacting at the project level, but also wanting to understand the dynamics within the communities that we are operating and what uh, our findings are revealed, uh, which, were, which are also kind of uh, cementing you know, our ongoing routine in order to understand the context. It revealed that there is high mobility when it comes to adolescent girls and young women. Remember, we're dealing with the young people, highly mobile, highly mobile, in terms of uh, even movements, both internally and externally. There's also increased passage and in migration to South Africa and Botswana for greener pastures. Uh, what, we, the, what the findings also revealed um, is the use of uh, drug and alcohol use, which is really uh, one of the challenges that uh, we are currently facing, even as a country. And we also picked uh, that there's also inconsistent uptake of PrEP due to cultural beliefs and misconceptions that people have. So the next slide. So what is it that we are currently doing in order to address some of uh, the contextual issues and some of the challenges that have been highlighted? So as a project, we really want to be strategic and where we target our interventions across three levels, at agency, at relations, and also at structures. So at agency, we are basically looking at how we could influence and impact change uh, at individual level. And this is also guided by the USAID um, uh, framework, the positive youth development, which also seeks to ensure that we build uh, the adolescent girls and their women's agency. We provide them with safe spaces where they have an opportunity for peer to peer networks and also building networks where they could also be supporting uh, each other. And in addition to that, we also have um, uh, uh, learned that we, re we really need to ensure that we have. Um, friendly, uh, youth-friendly platforms, e.g. where we basically use, you know, sport, edutainment, and role modeling uh, so that we reinforce a positive uh, message and create demand. Uh, at our relations level, this is where we are looking at uh, who relates with the adolescent girls and their women. Uh, we are looking at their families. We are also looking at their peers. We are also looking at their relations with their counterparts. So we have our uh, care parenting where we want to promote healthy relations and have conversations, especially where we noted that there are also misconceptions around our PrEP. We really need to ensure that the parents, they support uh, their, their children. And also not forgetting the male engagement. I think the, present, the, the presentation that was done, it really highlighted the need to ensure, yes, in as much dreams targeting adolescent girls and young women. There is uh, no way we would actually leave uh, male engagement so that uh, we promote health seeking behaviors, but also uh, wanting the, them to also support uh, adolescent girls and young women as agents of change around that. The last uh, pillar where we want really to ensure that there's nothing that we can do, especially where you want to address social norms, behaviors, structures, without really engaging key stakeholders. So we believe that coordination and collaboration across sectors for equitable quality HIV and sexual prevention is also very key. We have uh, different ministries that we engage so that we're able to create that uh, 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 collaboration and uh, we ensure that we provide the services as they would also be required. But um, uh, lastly, they say nothing for the community without the traditional leaders, the leadership who will not be able to really uh, 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 create that enabling environment. Yes, they need to ensure that we engage community leadership where we are talking about the political leaders, the traditional leaders, the religious leaders, so that we are engage them for them to be in a position to eliminate harmful social norms by creating or promoting access and uptake of services, most importantly around PrEP. This was my last slide, and thank you so much. Uh, before I close, I also want to really acknowledge, you know, um, uh, the government of America uh, through the United States or for international development, that's USAID and PEFA, for the support that they are also providing us, but not forgetting all the key ministries who actually enabled us to conduct the assessment to include community leadership, 
in the program uh, rights holders. I thank you. Thank you so much, Charity. You have really uh, taken us through some of the challenges, including geographical um, challenges, the cultural beliefs, um, family context, high mobility, and some of the um, strategies that you have used to overcome these challenges. And our next speaker, Dr. Chatin Chaudhary, is going to give us perspectives from India and the beauty of having this South to South learning um, situation is that there might be some things from Jatin's experience that may be useful to Charity's experience. So Dr. Jatin Chaudhary is the, a senior research associate at the Hamsafa Trust in India. And this is one of the first LGBTQ based organizations in India. He has been working on social media based HIV prevention interventions for men who have sex with men community, representing mental health on social media by the LGBTQ community. He has also been working with male and female sex workers, as well as on ART adherence among trans women living with HIV. And Jatin is going to be presenting about the strategies and models that worked for identification and subsequent engagement of hard to reach populations. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Ethel, you know the drill, just stop me. Uh, uh, let's make this room a little lively because we're talking about uh, colorful people. Um, uh, like Ethel mentioned, I'm Jatin. I'm a queer researcher and my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I will be sharing my experiences on engaging uh, communities on virtual platforms. Uh, so I will delve into the presentation. Uh, I will be talking about what are some of the factors that lead communities to being unreached. And I've purposefully not used the terms hidden, hard to reach or key populations. I think we heard them a lot during the last few days. Uh, some online and offline networks of engagement and uh, what are the strategies that we have been using to engage communities on online platforms. Next slide, please. So before we delve into what are some of the factors, uh, it is important to understand uh, a community. Uh, um, it is important to understand where the communities come from and uh, what are the community dynamics. Uh, uh, organizations or community-based organizations, uh, they they have access to the communities because they can provide them a safe uh, space. Uh, uh, whereas uh, challenges like legal or policy barriers, it uh, it makes the communities um, uh, not able to access uh, services and also um, uh, not able to access services and, and uh, also uh, uh, not be part of the care continuum and be part of research studies. At social level, we have stigma and discrimination that is that is there at at every level, uh, whether it be uh, uh, whether it be at the societal level, whether it be at the uh, school uh, colleges or uh, or or in all of those settings, which can have impact and cause mental health issues among the community, uh, uh, leading them, uh, leading to, you know, getting into uh, uh, adverse uh, uh, coping mechanisms. And at individual level, uh, communities, and these all of these factors leads to some amount of homonegativity within the individuals, where they would feel like, oh, why am I like that? And that leads to uh, uh, trust issues uh, uh, outside the community. So it is important for us to take cognizance that all of these factors uh, are and all of these factors are what make the communities more vulnerable and it is important to have the have uh, communities lead uh, uh, these uh, uh, research studies whereas uh, they because they understand the community dynamics next slide please here are some of the offline and online networks that are used by the communities. Some offline spaces of engagement, we have community spaces and events, uh, public toilets, local trains, and now there are uh, online uh, networks that are coming up, uh, like uh, uh, dating apps like Grindr, Planet Romeo, Blued. Uh, we have social media like Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, websites. So uh, these uh, online platforms, they were there in the past as well. But during COVID, we have seen there has been a surge uh, that uh, people have, there's a bridge bridge that has been created between the offline and online platforms where uh, individuals have started using both the platforms equally. And uh, next, please. 
and there are some of the reasons for increased usage of online platforms now the uh, dating apps are availability uh, are available for free there you can afford mobile plans smartphones uh, it provides wider reach and diversity and you can plan your sexual encounters and it provides a sense of privacy where you can block the other person or you know you can choose not to share your location or your profile picture uh, next slide please so how do we engage uh, uh, the uh, uh, the populations online on online communities uh, we have geo targeted advertisements these are some of the strategies that we use in our research studies but that can be tweaked for any population uh, uh, like paid advertisements on grinder you have banner ads where you can incorporate uh, your study links uh, you, we can have paid uh, promotion on instagram then uh, identifying the popular apps within the community is important there are n number of dating apps that are there, that are there uh, but with the help of community advisory board or community consultations uh, you can uh, you can identify which app is most popular among the community then we also use recruiters uh, who are actually peers who uh, go on these platforms and um, and reach out to the uh, in, uh, to the users so for them we have paid accounts so that they can reach out to uh, wider uh, profiles on grinder you can have that feature uh, we also uh, collaborate with community led influencers on instagram um, and and uh, when when you are doing a recruiter based recruitment it is important to have credible profiles of recruiters uh, and uh, since there are using there are um, uh, n number of dating apps or, or social media platforms and if you use diligently any app any app can be a dating app so um, so uh, so we what we do is we embed a source link or or have an extension like a bitly link where we capture where uh, where we are having maximum engagement and then we would uh, uh, use our resources uh, on on that platform so that we end up uh, saving uh, manpower uh, then this three step strategy is something that we have been using and has been successful in our studies so when a recruiter is reaching out to the communities it is not uh, it is not the first message has to be hey just, you know what let's uh, just participate in a research study you know that does not work because we have to understand that those dating apps are not research recruitment apps people are there for a different reason and you are uh, trying to buy their time so the first message has to be a greeting and you have to build a repo then you provide them the information that what is in it for them in the study and then you ensure follow up that because they tend to get a lot of messages and and the your message can get skipped so you need to follow up with them again uh when we do these strategies uh previous slide please thank you uh so it is important to adhere to uh, the uh, the platform's guidelines because our recruiters do get blocked uh, uh, all the time and uh, we try not to uh, use uh, advertising words so uh, and keep the con and keep it more conversational next slide thank you uh, so here are some of the recruitment posters that we have used. Uh, uh, if you can see, we have it in the local language as well as in English. We have these catchy lines. We have human figures. Uh, we have mentioned the honorarium that they would get if they fill a survey. Um, uh, so uh, uh, and we have the organization logo as well. So these help build trust within the community that this is not a this is not a fake thing on uh, going on dating apps. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the additional strategies? You'll have to press next again. Uh, what are some of the additional strategies while implementing? So to curb the uh, digital literacy, because not everyone on the platform is going to understand, we'll have to ensure that the language and design is as simple as possible. Uh, uh, because the attention span on social media and dating app is, is like, what, 10 seconds? Uh, so in, during that time, you have to make sure that whatever you're putting out there is engaging. And then providing organizations phone number or website to build trust. Not a lot of uh, 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 users would trust whatever a person is telling them on dating app uh, with regard to uh, longitudinal studies where follow up is involved it is imperative to collect multiple contact information because people on online platforms tend to change their phone number a lot and definitely correct use of pronouns is very very important you cannot use he or for a transgender woman uh, then uh, this is like i was talking about different strategies uh, 
there there are a few people who would who you would engage in like 10 15 minutes of having a conversation with them those are the innovators or early adopters they would want to be uh, you know they would be very enthusiastic they would want to be part of the study but then there are certain individuals who are in late majority or laggards who would need some time and all of this process engaging online communities is not a 5 minute thing or a 10 minute thing it takes time it takes as much as much time as it would take to engage somebody on offline platforms so we have to a uh, tailor our engagement approaches for different user categories next slide please uh, what are some of the strategies to facilitate hiv prevention intervention so uh, first of all uh, you'll have to do next again sorry the animations are a little annoying so what are some of the strategies that we we can use to engage uh, hiv prevention interventions so basically having a generalized messaging which is guided by theory not uh, not uh, uh, you know uh, having a messaging that targets a community it has to be generalized so that everyone can relate and involving communities from inception is very very important uh, next uh, leveraging on social media and dating apps you can use uh, whatsapp or instagram or all the social media platforms uh, to uh, deliver the content gamification approaches provide a sense of interaction with the intervention uh, inclusive healthcare facilities is important because if you are doing a research study that involves hiv testing or prep uptake or pep uptake it is important that uh, where your participants are going the services are inclusive um, home based delivery or teleconsultation where uh, uh, somebody from the community that doesn't want to walk into uh, health facilities uh, you can have home based facility or teleconsultation next and and very important and that's what we believe in uh, uh, with the communities by the communities and for the communities uh, we also need to visibilize queer researchers within the scientific community uh, next slide please so i would conclude that it is it is imperative to involve community members from the inception and and there is no one single strategy that can be used to involve communities online you have to try multiple strategies and then see what is working out for for you next slide please uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, 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 all our research participants who have contributed to this knowledge. I would like to thank the LGBTQIA plus community and sex workers community uh, uh, for existing. This is for us. And I would like to acknowledge the Humsafer Trust, IAVI, and all my mentors. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Jacqueline. I think the one thing that stood out to me is the issue of having geo-targeted advertising. And also really understanding the data online, the online data, what it, what it says, what the stats say. If I was to speak like an ICT person, but I won't. So next we're going to have a panel, um, a panel conversation. And I'm thinking just maybe to, so that we can engage a little bit more, um, I'd invite just one burning question to either of the presenters that has just presented, and then we can move on to the panel. Just one question. Your speed is your luck. Any takers? Okay. Yeah, please. Okay, um, on the last presentation, I would like to ask uh, how safe are these social media platforms for the MSM? I love that, nice and to the point. Uh, I think that's that's uh, that's something that's that we all have been talking about uh, uh, regarding safety on online platforms, and uh, still it gives you a lot of control on your interactions. Uh, whether you can choose on on which person you want to meet, you have the features like video calls, but there's a lot of catfishing that happens. So um, so uh, for this, there are features that can help you with that. You can video call before meeting, but there are challenges that. Uh, that uh, that are there and and for that legal and policy uh, uh, barriers are one because if you're caught and and at that point of time you want to reach out to somebody um, then it becomes difficult uh, and can be challenging so I think uh, before you are meeting somebody through dating apps or or it it 
you really have to weigh on a lot of factors at places where it it is uh, still not uh, legalized so a lot of responsibility on the user thanks so much uh, jatin so we will move on to the panel conversation and our panelists for today dr melissa wallace She's the Adolescent Social Behavioral Lead at the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation and an honorary senior lecturer in the School of Public Health at the University of Cape Town. She's a health psychologist and behavioral science researcher and has worked predominantly in adolescent HIV prevention research. If you just nod so that we can tell who it is. Yeah. <laughs> then we have uh, Yvonne Wangoy Mashira from Ayavi, Africa. She's a director for social behavioral research, leading, a strategic, uh, leading the strategic development and guiding the global execution of Ayavi's social behavioral research portfolio. She has over 21 years of multi-country experience across 10 countries in the African continent. And this is in conducting social behavioral research on a variety of social and public health subjects focused on acceptability and feasibility of products and intervention, as well as what are the factors that motivate health-related behavior. Yvonne. We have Paramita Saha from IRV India, and she's a program manager for social behavioral research and community engagement at IRV engaged in multi-site studies with key and vulnerable communities across India and Africa to understand the unmet health needs, the drivers of health seeking and HIV prevention practices towards informing develop the development and implementation of biomedical and public health interventions. And right next to me, we have Jawahara Nanyondo from Ayavi Africa as well, our Associate Director for Community Engagement at Ayavi, based in Uganda. For close to two decades, Jawahara has been leading the design and implementation of innov innovative community engagement strategies to support the conduct of research in infectious diseases through recruitment and retention of study participants into research programs for both clinical, trial, and observational studies. So that is our panel. Jara, well, I said you're next to me, so <laughs> that's obvious. <laughs> yes. So we've had, between all of us, we've had, you know, how many decades of experience in engaging these communities? And so I believe we really have a wealth of knowledge amongst us in as much as there are still more questions. Sorry, in as much as there are still more questions uh, that are still unanswered. So perhaps, Melissa, I'll ask you from your perspective, what has been your experience in engaging adolescent and MSM populations across the digital and the physical? Um, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's some some key things to bear in mind. Um, so for both of these populations, they um, have had experience of being marginalized and discriminated against um, in relation to their sexual behavior when they've engaged with health services. So I think the first thing is important is to ensure that there is a safe space so whether that's in the physical space or the digital space, that, that it's a safe space for them where they feel um, respected and um, you know treated with respect and um, and and that this you know that the service meets their needs. And the other thing is that um, you know that we need choice in terms of engaging populations. Um, so, you know, there's not going to be one strategy, as has already be, been mentioned, not just one strategy that's going to work for, for everyone. So, you know, with adolescents, we see that um, we, you know, we can reach them through schools. Um, some of them actually prefer clinics. Some of them prefer mobile services. 
Um, and then for MSM, we see that there's actually not a lot, in, a lot of engagement with traditional health services. So we, they, they tend to seek out services that are very specific to their needs. And also um, we engage them through the creation of safe spaces in the community um, where we can reach them and we you know, encourage other MSM to, to help with recruiting and reaching them as well. Um, and then um, I think the other thing is, um, yeah, what was the other thing I wanted to say? Okay, I think that's gone out of my mind. But yeah, I think those are the, oh yes, the other thing is, um, you know, I think also the use of physical and digital um, spaces to, to reach them. So, um, you know, we've, we've seen that um, uh, with, with adolescents, they're using a lot of um, social media platforms like um, TikTok and Facebook. And um, we've done quite a lot of demand creation using um, those platforms and also using social media influencers. That's been um, quite successful um, in reaching adolescents as well. I just had a quick follow-up question on that. And um, especially on the adolescents, the perspective of the adolescents, these being young and sometimes um, there's an aspect of consent, assent. Um, what are the challenges of, um, of reaching the, you know, the, the ones that are not of what we call the majority age? Um, so, so we've got a lot of experience um, with that um, at Desmond Duta Health Foundation. We've done a lot of engagement with um, adolescents over the years. We've also worked in terms of our, our research to, you know, work closely with our ethics committees um, in terms of seeking um, a waiver of parental consent for certain studies where we're able to justify that. Um, so, so yeah, we we. We are able to reach um, younger adolescents mm. and, you know, navigate that space in terms of the ethical, ethical and legal issues around that. Yeah. yeah. Jahara, I, I think I'd ask you the same question, and this this time it's from the perspective of engaging vulnerable uh, communities in core scientific studies. What has been your experience? Um, when, when you say core scientific studies, what do you mean? Clinical trials. Oh, clinical trials. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't want to say. Okay, sorry. I don't want to say that uh, it has been uh, difficult uh, because of um, the long time I have been in the field, um, and it has not been a job for one person to engage uh, the different uh, teams for clinical trial participation. It has been effort from, uh, for example, the policymakers or guideline developers. Um, I can draw the experience of um, uh, UNAIDS and EVAC uh, in 2007, when they came up with the framework that we have followed over time. For me, that simplified um, our engagement efforts in terms of uh, following or using the good participatory uh, practice, uh, participatory guidelines uh, that really shapes the process of when engagement should start uh, throughout the life cycle of the, uh, of the research. Um, several conversations through this week have mentioned that we need to engage people early enough. It is not any different from the clinical trials work as the inception process starts in terms of uh, um, protocol development from wherever it is happening, it is important that uh, conversations start. And conversation could take the shape of um, bringing the concept early enough to the uh, investigators that will implement the study, but also the stakeholders where the study is going to happen. And probably the policymakers in those countries where that study is going to happen including the ministries of health, um, particularly in Africa, where the phenomenon of clinical trials is not so popular, and I'll speak uh, for my country, Uganda, it is very important that these conversations start very early so that we don't get um, a, a roadblock um, along the way, and, and then that could lead in a lot of resources wasted. Because these are um, clinical trials are very expensive ventures to get into. So early engagement is very important. 
and if um, mapping out of the different stakeholders that you need to engage very early is very important. Um, um, we have the, 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 over time, there is a growing field of uh, advocacy, engagement, um, media engagement, depending on your risk uh, uh, assessment, you might need to start engaging these um, partners early enough to, to, uh, to work with you this journey of the clinical trials. Thanks a lot, Ajauhara. Thank you. Ivona, I'm interested in the social behavioral aspect and how does this play a role in, you know, in either enhancing or improving how the engagement with the communities happens? Thank you, Ethel, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to reference a study that Ayavi is supporting in Kenya and Uganda, and the study is called Uptake. Uptake is a study that has been running for three years where we are working with adolescent girls and young women as well as female sex workers to try and understand what informs their preferences um, around contraceptives as well as HIV prevention products. So when the study was designed, it was around the anticipation of the introduction of long-acting uh, HIV prevention product, uh, specifically Kabele. And because it is very clear with products that even though the product works, it doesn't mean that it will be used. And specifically looking at the populations who are at higher risk or more vulnerable, um, we would need to understand what drives their decisions to, or motivates them to use the products or not. Um, so when we started the study, we um, initially did a formative study with interviews and focus groups just to kind of get a feel of the ground on, you know, how participants, how the participants were actually using products, what their experiences had been, if they had stopped a certain product, why. Um, but what really tested our community engagement um, and you know reach of the adolescent girls and sex workers was when we started the second stage of the study where we were having uh, discrete choice experiments which are basically uh, behavioral experiments where you simulate different scenarios that are tied to the objectives of the study specifically looking at um, HIV prevention product use and contraceptive use um, so you know, coming into those studies, we had to be innovative. We needed to recruit uh, just over 200 adolescents and about the same number of sex workers in both Kenya and Uganda. So we did what is known as respondent-driven sampling. So how that works is that you have what we call seeds. So you specify a number of seeds based on the sample that you're targeting. And then the seeds, and the seeds are as diverse as possible, for instance, for AGYW, we were working with 15 to 24. For sex workers, we were working with 15 to 45. So you say you'll have 10 seeds on the AGYW side and 10 seeds on the sex worker side. And for the seeds, you need to ensure that they are very diverse in terms of characteristics, so age-wise. So say if all your seeds are of a certain age range, say they are between 20 and 22, then the participants that they'll help you recruit are also likely to be within that age range. So you want to try and ensure that it's as diverse as possible in terms of age and other socioeconomic and social demographic um, characteristics. Um, you also want to pick people from different um, residences in terms of ge geographic diversity. Um, and so what respondent-driven sampling is pegged on is social network theory that basically the networks that this person has, um, you know, will help you recruit participants who are kind of similar to them. And it's a more elaborate process because you have to first convince the seed to participate in the study. Once they agree, um, you know, you interview them for the study and then you give them a coupon to recruit a certain number of participants. And those participants then recruit another set and so on and so forth. So that's what we call a wave recruitment kind of process. Um, we found the respondent driven sampling or RDS as we call it, um, very effective in getting us participants. 
Um, and, you know, especially when you think about the fact that sex work in both Kenya and Uganda is illegal. Um, so these are, you know, populations who are typically stigmatized, um, who are typically underserved, who face a lot of stigma when they try to access health services. Um, so, you know, it was really, really helpful for us. Um, we did have some challenges, though. Um, so what would happen is that even though we would elaborately explain to the participants the inclusion criteria, um, on a few occasions we did meet participants or participants were referred to us who did not meet the inclusion criteria. But all in all, you know, in terms of weighing the advantages and disadvantages, RDS works really well. It also saves time. Um, there's trust because the participant who has been referred to you was referred by their friend who they trust, you know, already have a relationship with. Um, so it makes things, you know, a little easier and, you know, helps step, set the stage for the data collection process. Great. The word trust has been used a number of times. And yes. for all the participants, you know, all the speakers, we've, we've used the word trust at some point. Parameter, how do you build trust between the communities and the research teams? How do they get to engage in a way that the communities feel like we understand the research, we trust the researchers, we will work together with the researchers? Thank you for your uh, question, Ten. This is very, very important. And if we really look at the 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 HIV prevention landscape right now, we are in a very, very interesting cross section. So uh, the HIV science is really evolving. The, the strategies towards uh, HIV vaccine are, are changing, emerging with newer approaches. There are more early stage trials and the late stage trials uh, are not being supported so are not showing the desired results. So people are, scientists are going back to an early stage. Parallelly, what we have is that we have an expanding uh, toolbox of HIV prevention. There are ample number of efforts going on. There are long actings coming up. Now, if we look at the now, the, the perspective of the community or the potential end users or beneficiaries of all these innovation, we need to think, uh, I think we need to have a step back and start thinking that how the sh community's needs are also changing. So there are digital platforms which are coming up. There are risk profiles which are changing. UNH's data is showing, although we have done great net on uh, decreasing incidence, there are newer pockets of uh, 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 infection which are emerging. So to answer some of these questions or to address, to understand some of these questions, uh, what I'd refer to that NEDA, Government of India actually commissioned uh, a sort of a knowledge and evidence generation uh, with IRV uh, and the communities which are there out India to understand what are the translational gaps, where we are falling short, that even we have a very robust GPP, things are not getting translated on ground when there is community engagement. And there are people who are not engaged, who are not linked, who are still hidden and hard to reach, not by the choice, but by as the environment is not ready to bring them on board. So, so trust came out to be really a strong point from that uh, exercise as well. So one more thing which came up really strong is a, a huge asymmetry in information. So, so if we think of this, that the researchers and the scientists side have all the information around research processes, what are the scientific development which is going on, and what are the emerging technologies which are coming up, and why we are having these newer trial designs thing, kind of things. If we do not engage the community from early enough and disseminate these informations, taking care of the fact that the community is not one size fit for all, it's not homogeneous. So they have their own literacy background, they have their own lived experience. So we have to tailor 